Uh, my name is Japali Mukhopadhyay. I'm an assistant professor here at SIPA. Um, this is actually a session of my class, uh, which is Unconventional Warriors. But we decided, um, thanks to Ingrid Gersman and the Salzman Institute, to open this up to a larger audience. So welcome to those of you um, who've been able to join us. So what we're gonna do is have about 15 to 20 minutes each from our two speakers, and then we're gonna open it up into a discussion um, with active participation, certainly from my students and hopefully from everybody else um, who's joined us today. So let me start by introducing um, our speakers to you. So first we have Zach Mampili, and Zach Mampili is an associate professor of political science at Vassar College and is the director of the Africana Studies program. He has a doctorate in political science from the University of California in LA. And um, in 2012, 2013, he was the Fulbright Visiting Professor at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. He is the author of Rebel Rulers, Insurgent Governance and Civilian Life During War, published by Cornell University Press in 2011 and has another book coming out, or already out, uh, on its way out, um, with Adam Branch, entitled Africa Uprising, Popular Politics and Unarmed Resistance. Um, Zach, after Zach speaks, we're gonna hear from Christopher Day, who is an uh, assistant professor uh, in political science at the College of Charleston. Um, he is, his research interests extend to international security, counterinsurgency, proxy warfare, and the institutional role of armed actors um, in Africa. He was previously a disaster relief worker with Doctors Without Borders and um, earned his doctorate in political science from Northwestern University in June 2012. Um, Chris has published articles in comparative politics and civil wars and written a number of opinion pieces and is currently working on a book project about the fates of different rebel groups in Africa. So with that, Zach, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, well, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out today. Uh, thank you, Dipali, for having me and, and have hosting this event. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my book, uh, Rebel Rulers, Insurgent Governance and Civilian Life During War. I know some of you have actually read a chapter of the book, uh, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, and others haven't. So I'm going to try to provide just a general overview of what I was trying to do in this book. Um, which came out a few years ago and is based on my PhD dissertation at UCLA. The sort of starting question, and I'm gonna go quickly because I only have 20 minutes and this was a 45 minute presentation, so <laughs> hopefully I'll stay within my time. Uh, but the, the starting point for my project was, was a very basic question, uh, something that you know, uh, political philosophers have thought about for, for many, many years, and that is what happens when the government disappears. And I think if you've ever taken a, a political theory course or if you've just read Hobbes, you have a certain assumption about what might occur. And this is an image I took back in the day in 1999 in Nigeria during the transition from military rule in that country, uh, where the state essentially stopped providing any sort of public goods or public services. And this was actually a middle class neighborhood that had been overrun by giant piles of trash. Right? Uh, and I think we have a, a, a common perception that goes back to Hobbes that without a state, without a government of some sort, then chaos must ensue. And as I uh, you know, started looking at this question from a variety of different perspectives, what I realized very quickly is that you know, the scholarly literature has largely bought into this paradigm that, that suggests that without, without a state, without a government, then you must have disorder. If you look at the literature in international relations, for example, uh, there's a number of terminology that sort of reflects the ways in which these territories are treated uh, in the literature. For example, some people refer to them as black spots. Others have referred to them as ungoverned territories. Uh, and I think this actually speaks to what the uh, IR scholar Michael Barnett has referred to as the territorial trap. Right? In, in the IR literature, there's a tendency to assume that for each piece of territory, there is a defined sovereign government that must be in control. And where that condition does not hold, then there must be some sort of disorder. Right? Uh, and as we'll see, and as what I'll try to argue, is that this assumption uh, that without a governing authority that you must have uh, chaos is, is one that is, is rather problematic, but is perhaps one of the core beliefs of, of IR, but also of international law, which makes a similar assumption about the division of territorial space globally. If we turn our attention to comparative politics, 
there's a similar blind spot within comparative politics. There's an entire literature, for example, that has been devoted to the question of bandits. Uh, the areas that I'm interested in are often referred to as warlords. Um, and this reflects, again, what I think is a, a certain assumption that drives the comparative politic literature that is often referred to as statism. Right? The assumption that only states can provide some sort of political order and any other type of actor that emerges in a space that is no longer under the control of a state must be either a bandit or a warlord or some other type of, of terminology that actually is derived from, from, from feudal era. Right? The, the language of banditry, the language of warlordism uh, sort of gives away the plot in that it is language that clearly refers to an earlier era of international order, one characterized by all these kind of assumptions. And you'll see it in the literature as well. These bases are often referred to, for example, as fiefdoms, right? again, betraying their reliance on, on middle age uh, categories. What I'm actually interested in is, is in the, the broader question of insurgent civilian relations. Right? And there are a number of different ways in which insurgent groups can relate to civilians. And I'll show you exactly what type of groups I'm talking about, but just to give you a sense of the, the range of relationships that insurgents can strike with civilians. Of course, there are many groups that prefer to operate as roving bandits or roving insurgents. Right? Uh, the sort of paradigmatic example of this might be something like the Lord's Resistance Army in northern Uganda and other parts of Central Africa, a group that has existed for two or three decades now and has largely been able to survive precisely because they don't try to hold on to territory. They precisely, they use their mobility as an advantage that allows them to persist over time. I'm not interested in these particular cases. The cases that I'm interested in are what we would, might refer to as territorial insurgencies. And even here, insurgents have a, uh, have a set of options in terms of how they relate to local civilian communities. Of course, when you come into control of territory, you must always address the question of what you're going to do with the civilian population. And one option is to depopulate civilians. This is a, a strategy that different insurgent groups have, have attempted at different times. Uh, again, the paradigmatic, paradigmatic example could be drawn from the Central African context. The Rwandan Patriotic Front, uh, a group that fought a war in, in, in Rwanda in the early 1990s, when they came into control of territory in the northern part of that country, uh, this was primarily a Tutsi rebel group, they depopulated the area of the primarily Hutu civilians who lived in that territory. And that essentially negates the question of what you're going to do when you have to deal with civilian communities. Again, this is not a case that I'm particularly interested in. I, I'm interested in this third option, right? And in some ways this is uh, perhaps, um, uh, well, I wouldn't say it's the dominant mode, but, but it's a very frequent mode that we see in terms of how rebel groups choose to engage with civilians, and that is to establish some sort of governing structure through which to rule the civilian population. We see this currently uh, with groups like the Taliban, uh, things like the Islamic State. Uh, you have very clear governing relationships that are struck between the insurgents and the civilian population. And these are the category of rebellions that I was interested in for this book project. So what do I mean by rebel governance? Uh, you know, I'm talking about a variety of different things, a variety of different activities that armed groups might engage in in order to develop a governing relationship with the local community. These can include a police force, a legal system, schools, health clinics, roads and other infrastructural projects, a system of food distribution, the, the leveling of taxes and other duties, as well as incorporating a symbolic dimension, the ways in which armed groups try to assert their legitimacy by embracing certain sovereign practices associated with the nation state. So here I'm talking about the deployment of costumes, anthems, <coughs> flags, currencies. Uh, a more formal definition of what I mean by rebel governance is the provision of public goods, as what we just talked about, the administration of regulatory functions, and the deployment of symbolic elements in order to legitimate the governing authority. All of this is designed, again, to go back to what I was talking about at the beginning, to establish forms of political and social order within areas in which the state is no longer able to assert its sovereign claims. Instead, the armed group emerges as the purveyor of political order within these spaces. Right? Establishing political orders that are both outside, and importantly for my theoretical framework, against the state itself. Right? They're not simply taking territory to hold territory, but also because they have a political objective of defeating or replacing the state. Some examples, this is not a new phenomenon. If we look here in the United States, of course, we can go back to the Confederacy, which had a very elaborate rebel government. Uh, actually, the title of my book, Rebel Rulers, is taken from an 1863 reference to the Confederacy in the New York Times. Uh, there are other examples, Toussaint Louverture in Haiti, 
Here in the US also more recently, the Black Panthers established a variety of, of social provision, social goods provision in parts of Oakland and other areas that they were able to assert some degree of territorial control over. Some of the more prominent recent cases, the FARC in Colombia at various points has held up to 40% of Colombian territory, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Lebanon, and more recently, as I mentioned earlier, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Just to give you a sense of what some of this looks like, uh, here is a school that I visited in South Sudan during the war in that country. Uh, this is the courts complex from the, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ilam in northern Sri Lanka. Essentially, this was the Supreme Court that they established during the war in that country. Uh, here is a, an, an administrator uh, with the SPLM in South Sudan. And this is a picture of a school that I visited in, in northern Sri Lanka, uh, established by the Tamil insurgency. So what were the sort of, oh, let me, these are some of the symbolic elements. Some of you may know who, anyone know who that is? Jefferson. Very good, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. Little known fact that the Confederacy actually issued its own stamps, uh, which you can find online. Here is a currency that the SPLA uh, printed in South Sudan. They never actually distributed this currency. It was just something that they printed as part of their nationalist claims. Uh, throughout the war, if anyone actually had been there, you would know that they actually preferred dollars and euros. Uh, this is a, an image of the Taliban flag. Uh, and this is a, a, a graveyard that was built by the LTTE during the war in that country. And I think this is a good Im example of, sort of some of the symbolic elements that go into constructing a legitimate authority. It was very central, not only as a place to, to, to put the dead, uh, but it was also used regularly to hold rallies and other types of memorial functions uh, that were devised in, to, to propagate the legitimacy uh, of the Tamil insurgency. All right, so what were the overarching questions that I wanted to address in this book? There are basically two. Why do some insurgents establish structures and ruling practices that provide services and regulate civilians, while others do little for their population? So I'm interested in the variation between territorial insurgencies. But beyond just sort of what the intentions of the insurgency are themselves, I'm more interested in perhaps in what explains variation, the effectiveness of insurgent government. Right? It's one thing for most armed groups, most revolutionary movements to say that they are going to establish some sort of parallel order, but simply uh, claiming that you've now established a, a legitimate government in the areas that you control is not quite the same thing as establishing something like an effective insurgent governing system. Right? Uh, and so that was the, the real kind of concern that drove my, my research process, which I can say a little bit about. Um, essentially what the book does is devote about half of its attention to a study of the phenomenon of insurgent governance, and I lay out in a variety of different hypotheses that I think uh, help account for the variation that, that I'm interested in. Uh, but it's also interested in, 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 in detailed case studies of three particular insurgent groups that were uh, active in the late 2000s and that I was able to visit multiple times. Uh, the, the, the Rally for Congolese Democracy in Eastern Congo, the Liberation Tigers at Tamil Ilam in Sri Lanka, and the SPLA, in, in the Sudan People's Liberation Army in Sudan. And the basic mode uh, of research that I, that I chose to do was, was, was to try and engage in uh, a, a series of visits to field sites in each of these territories, so actually try to enter into areas that were controlled by these various armed groups, and simply go about asking civilians a series of very basic questions about daily life in these areas of, ar of rebel control. So things like, well, where do you send your child to school? Uh, what do you do if you get into a dispute with your neighbor? Where do you go if you need some sort of health services? And through that, I was able to try to put together a picture of what governance provision was like within each of these three rebel-controlled territories. Uh, I don't have time to really go into the details behind each of these groups, but let me just show you a little bit of background on each of them. Uh, this is the RCD. This was their flag. Uh, this is a, just to give you a sense of the extent of the territory that they controlled in eastern Congo. So we're not talking about tiny little villages, but rather massive areas of control. Uh, this area in yellow here is the part of Congo that was under the control of the RCD during the war. Uh, and Congo, to give you a sense of the scale, is a country that itself is the size of Western Europe. So it's a fairly massive piece of territory and a very large population of civilians that they were able to govern during this period. These are just two of the leaders. Uh, of, of the RCD, I, I could say more about them, but maybe I'll hold off since I don't want to go too long here. Uh, some images from the Sudan People's Liberation Movement. This is their flag. Again, you can get a sense of the size of the territory. 
The areas in light blue here are the areas that were controlled by the SPLA during the war. Uh, to give you a sense of the scale, this is an area about the size of Texas. So again, uh, a fairly large piece of territory. And here was the leader of the SPLA, a man named John Garang, uh, who, like the previous slide, was also a US educated uh, individual. He had a PhD in agricultural economics from Iowa State. Uh, the final group is the LTTE. This was their, their flag. This is a map of the different territories that they controlled during the war. The area at the top was their sort of main area of control. The areas in lighter gray were areas of contested control. And I actually visited uh, both the northern and eastern parts of their territory during the field research process. Uh, and here is the, the, the leader of the LTT, a man by the name of Prabhakarin, who was the least educated of all the three leaders. And, and I'll explain why that matters in a minute. Let me first just cover what are perhaps some of the alternate explanations that have been offered to account for the variation in governance provision by armed groups. Um, a general point is to, to well, a general observation is to point out that most of the studies that have come out on, on insurgency, especially when I was starting this research, were primarily focused on questions of, of the use of violence or the recruitment tactics that were deployed by armed groups in, in specific contexts. And so many of these analyses were drawing on theoretical frameworks that were used to understand these questions and not really concerned with the issue of governance itself. First, of course, is ideology. That is one that has a long history in the study of armed groups. There you see very clearly, if you go back to, to Mao, well, let me talk about this in a minute. The other is polit the political economy approach, and I'll talk about both of what these are right now. Um, ideology, very simple assumption here. Rebels de develop governments in line with the leader's ideological beliefs. This has a long history, as I was saying. Uh, if you go back to some of the seminal guerrilla theorists from many different parts of the world, you see a similar concern with the administration of territory. Uh, you know, if you look at sort of the grandfather of, of guerrilla theory, Mao Zedong in China, you see that this is a very central concern of his. Uh, but continuing through Che Guevara, Ho Chi Minh, Amilcar Cabral, they all devote huge portions of their seminal tracks on the how to fight guerrilla warfare to this question of how you administer territories for the, for, for the purpose of winning popular support. Right? The basic argument being that if you are trying to take and, admit, and, and control a piece of territory, you cannot subject the civilian population to coercion alone because eventually... Ah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 yeah, there you go. Because uh, eventually the civilian population will turn against you and that will affect your long-term strategic objectives. Right? So they put a lot of effort in their, in their, in their, in their, in their treatises uh, to discuss the importance of, of, of administering territory and how that can help uh, guerrilla movements achieve their objectives in the long run. More recently, probably uh, towards the turn of the millennium, there was a, a whole new paradigm that emerged, largely driven by uh, economists initially, but political scientists, that focused on the question of natural resources and how this might determine insurgent behavior. Right? And it starts from a very obvious uh, uh, reality, and that is that many armed groups rely on natural resources uh, in order to fuel or to fund their insurgencies. And from that observation, there are a lot of assumptions about what that might mean in terms of how armed groups treat civilian populations. Specifically, uh, the assumption um, most commonly is that groups that rely more heavily on natural resources to fund their activities are less interested in the question of popular support and hence more reliant on coercion in order to subdue the civilian population, whereas groups that are relatively resource poor uh, would, are, are likely to devote more resources to the question of governance because they need to rely on the civilian population uh, in order to, 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 to wage war. If we look at the three cases that I was interested in and see this question of, of how well it fits into these two alternate explanations, uh, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this, mainly because I'm down to a few minutes. Uh, but the basic point of this slide is that neither of these alternate explanations are particularly useful in terms of understanding the three cases that I was interested in. And with my dissertation, I looked at a larger sample. And again, I found that their explanatory value was not particularly good. Right? Both the ideological explanation as well as uh, and the, the source of funding explanation had a number of, of problems. And I'll just outline what those were. Um, most obviously, they are not very good at predicting the behavior of armed groups when it comes to questions of civilian governance. Part of this, I think, is uh, related to the fact that both the ideological explanation as well as the natural resource explanation are what we refer to as path-dependent explanations. They tend to assume that the initial conditions that an armed group face uh, 
faces will determine the life trajectory of that armed group in regards to its treatment of civilians. And I find this to be problematic for a variety of reasons. Just to give you a, a very simple example, if we looked at the question of natural or, 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 or resources and armed groups, uh, just one of my cases, the LTTE, relied on 10 different sources of funding over the course of its war with the government of Sri Lanka, and these sources of funding did not seem to correlate at all uh, with their treatment of civilians across different time phases of the war itself. Right? And, and in fact, what you often see uh, is that armed groups tend to be very, very uh, sophisticated in terms of shifting between a variety of different funding strategies in terms of uh, when, 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 when one option is cut off, they're easily able to transition to another. So I find this path-dependent assumption to be very problematic. Instead, what you find is that governance tends to evolve over the course of the war, as I'll discuss in a minute. They also tend to assume that armed groups are, are solely determined by the beliefs and actions of the rebel leadership. They're, they're essentially top-down models. So if you have an armed group that is, 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 is a Marxist movement, for example, then, that, then, then their treatment of civilians will reflect the ideological beliefs of the leaders. And I, again, uh, I find this to be a very problematic assumption. And related to that, of course, is that if you have a, a completely top-down model, you tend to downplay the agency of civilians and tend to ignore the broader question of the international community, both of which I think are important. So let me just talk briefly. How am I doing on time? About three minutes. About three minutes. All right, let me, <laughs> let me talk very briefly about my own approach. Uh, I'm not suggesting that the initial preferences of rebel leaders are irrelevant. I think they matter. Right? But I think that it's, uh, they're highly contingent on a variety of other factors. So what I'm interested in are both sort of the initial preferences that the rebel leaders enter into the conflict with, but equally important, or perhaps more importantly, uh, the conflict produced dynamics that determine the various outcomes that I saw in each of these cases. In particular, what I was very interested in and what I was able to do with the field research process is to try to understand the broader political environment that rebel le leaders navigate in, in regards to their relationships with civilians, and in particular in regards to the types of governing systems that they establish. And what I found is that in fact these interactions with a variety of other actors in the conflict zone are often determinative of the types of governance systems that come into being. So here I'm talking about uh, relationships with civilians, relationships with other states, relationships with religious institutions, international organizations, non-governmental organizations, multinational corporations, it's, it are all central to how we understand the types of governance outcomes that I saw in each of the cases that I was interested in. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about both of these two uh, sets of factors. In terms of the initial preferences of armed groups, uh, I have a couple of hypotheses on what I think is important. Uh, the first is state penetration. Here I'm, I'm talking about the history of governance that has defined a particular territory vis-a-vis -vis the central state prior to the outbreak of conflict. The reason I think this is important is that you know, governance, uh, which I have a lot to say about, but I won't today, uh, <laughs> uh, is, 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 is very much a subjective reality. Right? What you think of your own local government is largely based on your own experience with local governance. And if you are from a part of the US, for example, like Massachusetts, you might have a certain set of assumptions about what governance means that vary dramatically with, say, Montana, right? Uh, and that's no different in conflict zones. Civilians are not uh, mindless actors. They actually have preferences. And so when we talk about the best way to understand what civilian preferences might be, well, a good starting point is to look at the history of governance that has affected or that has determined uh, civilian experiences with governance prior to the outbreak of conflict. Right, so when you are a rebel group and you're coming into control of territory for the first time, a good way to assess what civilian preferences might be would be to understand what their relationship was to the central state prior to your arrival. Right. And what I suggest is that if a rebel group enters into a space where civilians have had long histories of decent service provision by the central state, that they will expect the same of the rebel government or the rebel group once they take control of the territory, and the converse also being true. The second is about the broader political or strategic objective of the insurgency. Here I'll draw a distinction between secessionist groups or groups that are trying to actively carve out a piece of the state territory from the state itself versus groups that are actually trying to capture power in the center. Right? My key assumption here is that a secessionist group at its core, anytime you're trying to make a secessionist authority, you are concerned with the establishment of a parallel authority. And as such, you have to pay greater attention to the question of governance 
in contrast to a group that is trying to capture power in the center, where instead you might be able to say, well, you can trust us that once we come to power, we will enact a series of reforms that will be in your interest, right? Uh, a secessionist group does not have that sort of luxury <coughs> because they are trying, their basic existential reason for being is about establishing an alternate and better order to the central government. So if you look at these sort of arrayed on a two by two chart, just sort of gives you a sense of what I might predict in regards to the initial preferences of armed groups. Essentially what I'm suggesting is a group that is coming into a territory that has experienced a history of high state penetration and that espouses a secessionist objective is more likely to pay attention to questions of governance and hence establish more effective governance versus a group, well, you see how it plays out in this little table. Let me talk about the conflict by due dynamics because as I mentioned earlier, I'm not interested only in the initial preferences of the rebel leaders, but equally again or more interested in, in, in how armed groups in, interact with a variety of actors once they take control of territory. And here there's a whole variety of different factors that I think are important. I won't talk about each of them because I think uh, I'm out of time, but I'm interested in the organizational capacity of the armed group, which, by which I mean the command structure. Uh, I think there's a difference between groups that are able to establish a clearly hierarchical command structure within the armed group versus those are, that are deeply factionalized. I'm also interested in the presence of rival armed groups. I'm also interested in whether the groups adopt a Maoist approach, and here I don't mean um, Maoist in the sense of a, of a political formula, but rather in terms of uh, a strategic formula, and these are what I distill that down to. I'm also interested in the influence of other political actors. I divide these into varying categories, what I refer to as supporters, as well as competitors, because I don't want to presume that all international or regional actors are going to have the same impact on governance outcomes, but rather try to tie that back to their particular interests. <clears throat> Let me just say a little bit about how I try to determine effectiveness in this case. Uh, what I was looking at, as I mentioned earlier, were three particular uh, things. The establishment of a policing and legal mechanism, the establishment of a basic health and educational systems, as well as the establishment of participatory structures. You'll see the third one I, I, I perceive as being optional. Um, so really what I was trying to determine is, is the first two, and most importantly, uh, civilian usage of the above, right? So I'm not just interested in sort of paper institutions, but also whether it's civilians are really going to these institutions to take advantage of them. I won't say anything about the fifth one, but that was one of the objective measures I tried to use to, to correlate some of the findings that I, that I, that I had. Very quickly, just to give you a sense of what each of these groups were able to do, the RCD GOMA in my book represents the case that was least effective in terms of the governance systems that they were able to establish. Here, just to give you a sense, these are Kodogo, these are child soldiers essentially that the RCD often relied on. Uh, here are some pictures from the inside of a UN helicopter and a UN agency. Essentially what you see in Eastern Congo during this period uh, is that whatever order was being produced was being produced by outside actors, uh, completely outside of the control of the armed group itself. And so there were these massive refugee camps that were established by the UN, uh, and civilians largely fled to these, armed, the, to these refugee camps in order to avoid or escape the control of the armed groups. Right, here's another picture of, of, of that. The SPLM represents sort of a, a median case. They were largely ineffective in, in developing a, a health and educational system, but they were able to address uh, sort of legal and uh, policing issues in their territory. Whatever uh, services they were able to provide for health and education were largely done through international NGOs, which the SPLM required to sign a memoranda of, understand memoranda of understanding, which delimited the specific areas and the types of activities that NGOs could operate within South, within South Sudan. Uh, so they were sort of the in-between case between the, the, the RCD and, as we'll see, the Tamil Tigers. Again, a picture of John Garang, the currency. Here are some roads, again, not very impressive, but certainly a road nonetheless that the, L the SPLA had built in South Sudan. And here are just some pictures of children I took, uh, as you can see, all malnourished, meaning that the SPLM was clearly not doing a very good job in establishing a food distribution system in its territory during the war. And this is backed up by all sorts of empirical data about how people actually were dying during the war in Sudan, um, which perhaps I'll say something about at the very end. Last one is the Tamil Tigers, and here, uh, actually, they were able to establish a fairly effective governing system. Uh, they had very effective uh, education and healthcare systems, as well as a, a policing and judicial mechanism. 
Uh, very interestingly, the, the Tigers actually established a, a joint mechanism with the Sri Lankan state, and so that education and healthcare continued to be paid for uh, by the state, even as it was controlled by the Tamil Tigers in, in their territory. So this is a picture of a, of a Tiger school. As you can see, the children all have uniforms, they have tables, they have chalkboards. In fact, it's not that much worse off than what you would see in government-controlled territories. Uh, this, again, is a picture of a tiger mausoleum, give you a sense of the scale of their symbolic activities in the territory. Here is a, the picture of uh, the headquarters of the Tamil Elam police. If you had visited northern Sri Lanka during this period, you would actually see Tamil tiger traffic cops on, on many of the major streets. Uh, in this picture, I didn't get a great shot of it, but this is essentially the tiger foreign ministry that they established, where the leaders of the tigers hosted visitors from the World Bank, the IMF, and a variety of international institutions who would visit them at this uh, foreign embassy, essentially. Well, I'm not going to talk about this slide too much, but essentially it says that I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just finish by saying a little bit about this idea of counter-state sovereigns uh, that I try to advance in the book. I mean, the question, of course, then is, well, what do we do with this information? And what I try to suggest is that there perhaps are situations in which we might grant, and we, I mean the international community, might grant to certain armed groups a limited degree of recognition in, if they are able to establish something like an effective governance structure. The reason I believe this is important is because in many territories, if you want to access the civilian population living in rebel zone, rebel control zones, uh, you have no choice but to work through the rebel governance system. And so the rebel governance system itself is the primary interface linking the population with the international community. And pretending like that's not the truth is no way to actually deal with the needs of civilians caught behind rebel lines. Uh, this is actually entrenched within international humanitarian law, which as I mentioned at the beginning, actually ignores the existence of rebel governments. Armed groups actually have no standing under, inter in under, under international law, what is referred to as juridical personhood, uh, and that's something I would try to rectify by offering a degree of, of limited recognition. And again, I don't think this should be uh, offered on a blanket level, but that we need to find ways, and this is what I tried to do in my book, to differentiate between insurgents based on their civilian governance performance and offer limited recognition in, in, in exchange uh, for those groups that take the question of civilian governance seriously. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Right. Hi there. Right, my name's Chris Day. I'm from the Political Science Department at the College of Charleston. Um, thank you so much for, to Polly for inviting me up here. And nice to see Zach as well. He was actually at the College of Charleston just last week giving a talk. Um, both DePauli and Zach have been very supportive of me in this book project, which is still ongoing. But I'm going to take a little snapshot of it today uh, to deliberately try to tie it to, to Zach's <coughs> presentation and his book, to try to see if we can tie it together to generate an interesting discussion. So my book project is based on my dissertation. It's called Fates of Rebels. And I'm mainly concerned about rebel groups in Africa, but it does have generalizable implications more comparatively, more globally. And I start, first of all, I start looking mainly at African insurgency groups. And it goes back to my former life as an aid worker. And I'm going to anecdotally try to tie in some of those experiences into how those have informed how I approach this project. This is before I was doing an impersonation of an academic. I was an aid worker for about 10 years. <laughs> um, but um, the way I'm framing the book um, is in certain, I think you can't really see that very well. I'm sorry for that. Most of the time when we understand how conflicts end, there's a very small literature based on this, okay? And we tend to focus on outright victory and outright defeat of either state actors or armed actors. So it's usually reduced to a question of win, lose, or draw, who wins or loses. And in the odd case of the literature that does talk about peace accords or political settlements, it's usually approached from the perspective of political settlements that are imposed at the behest of outside actors, like outside interventions, the United Nations, et cetera, et cetera. And so what I'm trying to do is tell a different story about how conflicts end from the perspective of the insurgent groups themselves, because for them, victory can mean different things and defeat can mean different things. There's a lot of post hoc rationalizations that go on when you talk to armed groups. Um, goals can change throughout conflict. Uh, there's a fluidity of war aims over the course of a civil war. For example, um, the SPLA, you know, John Garang always had this view of a united democratic Sudan, 
but that was at odds with a lot of people within the SPLA that wanted secession in their own independent state, which was the outcome that won out. And he was a bit of an ideological chameleon as well. He was a Marxist at the beginning and then changed to more, uh, more of a Democrat towards the end. So um, at the end of a war, um, these conflict outcomes can actually be very subjective. So I'm trying to look at it through the lens of, of rebel fates in particular. And there's a whole range of fates that are beyond victory and defeat. That um, they look like they might be similar, but they're actually quite different. So I'm going to take a couple of examples today uh, to try to uh, cast these in more sharp, sharp relief. And I'm going to try to put it in the context of Zach's presentation and ask the question, does rebel governance matter for these different rebel fates as, a, as one potential explanation? All right, so we're going to start with the R RUF of Sierra Leone, the Sierra Leone Revolutionary United Front. And this is more of a stripped down, crude uh, version, conceptualization of, of rebel governance. I worked for Médecins Sans Frontières for about a year in rebel-held territory back in 2001. And I was in the high command of the RUF in a town called McKenney. And the RUF are emblematic of the predatory rebel group in Africa. The emblematic of the image, the iconic image of the child soldier, uh, conflict diamonds, uh, very violent towards civilians. And when I first arrived in McKinney, my very first question was, where, where is everybody? Uh, there was uh, you know, charred hulks of cars on the side of the road. The only vehicles were ours, the RUFs looted SUVs and eventually the, the UN started to deploy peacekeepers. And my experience with, with them in terms of rebel governance is that they were very predatory, very harsh. Um, you know, they stripped the copper wires from the hospital to sell them, and they looted everything in the town. And McKenney was only left intact because the leader, the guy that became the leader of the RUF towards the end of the war, Issa Sese, was from there. So he put certain prohibitions on destruction, but not on looting. And if you looked very carefully, there was rudimentary systems of taxation set up, but really basic, like child soldiers going house to house, collecting cups of rice every day from people, people going to the market to extract certain taxes, and not to mention the regular shakedowns at checkpoints and roadblocks. Um, but if you weren't willing to give things up to the RUF, RUF they would, would habitually take them. And so they were known as a highly predatory, very violent rebel group. And what happened to them eventually was that they disintegrated. Okay, they didn't really win and they didn't really lose. They had a chance to join the government in a political settlement in 1999 with the Lume Peace Agreement and they blew it. Uh, Fodi Sanko, the leader of the RUF, was made vice president and minister of strategic and mineral resources. In other words, he was in charge of the country's diamonds. Mike Lamine, who was a politico of the RUF, he was made Minister of Trade and Finance. And there was another, uh, another number of cabinet positions given to their, their top leaders. Um, but some of the more military-minded of the RUF decided that they didn't want to join the government, and they deliberately started to spoil the peace process. And the government soon found that they couldn't do business with the RUF, and so the peace process unraveled very quickly, actually, um, when my good friend, Augustine Bao, who is now in prison for war crimes. You know, he's a war criminal, but he's still my friend. Um, we used to sit and have conversations about revolutionary politics. He would rant and I would listen to him. Um, he kidnapped several hundred UN peacekeepers. And it threw the UN into crisis. And they started wondering whether or not they should be in the business of peacekeeping at all if, if a bunch of ragtag rebels could so easily cart so many of their peacekeepers away. But anyways, what happened is that eventually unraveled. And by the time early 2002, late 2001, in Wusum fo football stadium, which was right next to my office, there was a ceremonial end of the war, a ceremonial arms burning ceremony where Issa Sese, the interim leader and the president of Sierra Leone, announced the end of the war and they had a ceremonial arms burning ceremony. The RUF had disarmed, demobilized, and they were busy in the reintegration programs supported by international donors. But very quickly after that, the RUF, which had up until that point controlled two thirds of the country, essentially vanished as an organization. Some of them tried to organize themselves into a political party but failed. 
Isis Esse, Augustine Bao, a guy named Maurice Colon, were bundled off by the Special Court of Sierra Leone to face indictments of war crimes, and they were all three indicted. And most of the rank and file basically just went into the ether of Sierra Leonean society and were never heard from again. So it was kind of a remarkable fate for this rebel group. They didn't quite lose militarily, um, and they blew their chance of having this fate of incorporation into the state, which could have been seen as a victory. Okay, and this stands in contrast, um, a year or two later, I went to Cote d'Ivoire, or Ivory Coast, um, where the Force Nouvelle was in charge of, <coughs> I'd say, almost just a little bit over half of the northern part of the country. And it was actually a, a coalition of three rebel groups. By the time I arrived, the two rebel groups that controlled the western part of the country, the MPCE and the MJP, had folded into the dominant group in the north, and collectively they'd become the Force Nouvelle. But what I found in Cote d'Ivoire, I mean, they, say, they faced very similar humanitarian situations of malnutrition and lack of health services, but dealing with the Force Nouvelle was a lot different than dealing with the RUF. If I wanted to talk to a RUF commander, you know, you find the most opulent mansion in the town and you go talk to the RUF commander there and usually they'd be holding court like a sultan. And so they'd be sort of lounging back in some couch, the compound littered with child soldiers and depending on the time of day, the level of drunk and stoned would vary depending on the time of day. Now this is different in, in Force Nouvelle controlled territory where in fact they occupied the sous-prefecture, the actual building in RUF controlled territory, they ransacked, looted, and destroyed all the, the government buildings. But the Force Nouvelle occupied them, and they took on a role as a state builder, per se. So if you wanted to go meet with a rebel commander, you had to wait in the waiting room, and there was a secretary taking your name and calling your name when it was your turn. And by the time you got to talk to the rebel commander, instead of having some sort of sultanistic experience, he was tired from dealing with local tribal elders and having to deal with issues of adjudication and solving all sorts of local problems and he'd be like, what do you want? And it's always, by, by the way, a very good idea to become friends with the secretaries because they usually get moved ahead in the line. But it reminded of an Onion article that came out like last year, like a rebels in Zambia immediately regret seizing power because <laughs> they're like, oh my God, what were we thinking? Now we have to govern. So they took on the un unintended burdens of state building and, and governance. And you, know, you could see this, there was long lines of people waiting to talk to them to get patronage or have them solve disputes. And interestingly enough, um, what happened to the Force Nouvelle is that they were incorporated into the state through a political settlement. In fact, their leader, Guillaume Soro, was named prime minister and um, was able to contest in elections. And right now the MPC, is now a political party in Cote d'Ivoire. And the, the person that they supported in the last round of elections has become president. Laurent Bagbo, the president of Cote d'Ivoire, held on to power. Um, he contested the election results, and the UN actually had to force him out of power physically. But the Force Nouvelle is now a political player. All right, very interesting contrast. Intuitively, you might expect to see rebel governance matter to the different trajectories of these two rebel groups, right? You have the RUF case where you had very low levels of civilian support because of their predatory behavior. So you might expect to see that lead to this outcome. Well, they didn't win because they didn't deal with civilians very well. In fact, if you talk to rebel commanders now, they even say, well, the big mistake we made is that we were too nasty to people. We didn't get them behind us. And you might expect to see, well, rebel groups that are able to establish these micro-political structures to govern might fare better in civil wars. But there's a few problems with this potential explanation. All right, the first is that how much support is necessary to win or to be victorious or to succeed or to have some kind of victory? A lot? How much? What percentage? It's a little bit ambiguous. Right? How much support do you need in order to succeed as a rebellion? And if you look on the ground, what's more likely to happen is that the support that people get, you see these guys, they're looking kind of dejected. The support that they get is usually the result of coercion and intimidation. 
that violence against civilians, even in the context of rebel governance, makes people do things they wouldn't normally do, and that might mean support a rebel group, even if there is some level of micro-political structure that grants reciprocity arrangements between civilians and rebel leaders. Okay, so that's one flaw. The other flaw is that what happens when rebel comes to, re rebels come to town in many African contexts? People leave. All right, anybody with means, they leave the country. All right, anybody with transportation leaves the town. And they usually go to capital, the capital city. They become refugees in other countries or IDPs within their own country. And this is what you see. So what, what rebels are actually governing are a patchwork of communities and the leftovers from flight. So the most civilian, the most vulnerable people, and that's why people like MSF go there. You're dealing with the most vulnerable people that are left behind in a conflict. I call it the old and the pregnant, really the most vulnerable people there. So it doesn't capture a full picture of rebel governance because who are you dealing with? Anybody of, of means or, or, or notability or notoriety has usually left, particularly government officials. That's why they're able to occupy the government buildings. And finally, um, there are cases, and Zach mentioned this. Um, anybody know who this is? It's Joseph Coney, right? Where you have rebel groups that are notoriously nasty towards civilians. Um, they don't make any attempts at governance, and they still manage to survive. And like Zach said, um, they're on their, their third decade now uh, of, of surviving. Now, like Zach said as well, this might mean something different. This might mean that because they're roving, they don't have any ambitions to control territory. This might be a different type of rebel group that sits outside of this conceptualization. But the point is that you can have high levels of predation and a high likelihood of survival. And if you look at the SPLA case as well, um, the SPLA were notoriously violent against many civilians in the, the equatorial um, parts of South Sudan. Okay, so, so these are some of the flaws in those explanations. So where I come in, what I think is going on is that if you look at the structural anatomy of rebel groups, the variation is not necessarily along the axis of rebel governance. It's who are the people in charge of these rebel groups. Some rebel groups consist of what I call political insiders, and others are consist of what I call political outsiders. And what I mean by that is that insiders mean that the rebel group is mainly it mainly comprises members of the political establishment, former members of the political establishment. These are rebel groups that arise from the political fabric of the state. So sometimes you can have even small patronage networks of elites that break off and are the, the core of rebel groups. In other cases, you have entire battalions. So for example, the SPLA was a mutiny of a whole battalion of soldiers in the south, okay? so. I think this is the thing that matters the most to different rebel trajectories for two reasons. The first is that what it does is it gives organizational endowments to rebel groups when they start up. So rebellion has certain startup costs. You have to train, you have to recruit, you have to equip, you have to get resources. Groups of insiders already have pre-war organizational endowments and networks that they have cultivated by being in proximity to state institutions for any number of years. So they come into the organization of rebellion with already, those already intact. Okay, whereas outsiders don't. They have to work on developing these organizational endowments during the course of a conflict, which is more costly, and in the contingent environment of civil war, which is very violent and unpredictable. And the second thing is from the perspective of the state that they're fighting. In the African case, it might not be outside of Africa, but I'm, I'm making a theoretical statement here that if you are a regime and you're dealing with former insiders or former elites, you're more likely to do business with them than you are to do it with, do with outsiders because you might know them. You might know them personally. You might have gone to school with them. You might have been in the same clubs with them or trained in the military with them. All right, and it's also, if you're dealing with this intact organizational endowment, it's actually less costly to incorporate them than to try to eliminate them. You pull them in, you co-opt them, you accommodate the elites through political settlement. So you're more likely to face this trajectory of victory through incorporation um, for, through political settlement. It gives you some kind of status within the prevailing political establishment. Okay, outsiders, 
I don't know who you are. It's costly for me to figure out how to work you into the political establishment. So it's less costly to just try to eliminate you militarily. Okay, so if you look at the two cases I brought up in the beginning, the RUF were outsiders. Okay, their second in command, Sam Bokery, before joining the RUF, he was a disco dancer and a hairdresser. All right, and the, the bulk of their commanders were drawn from internment diamond diggers or people sprung from prisons in Liberia or Issa Sese was a cobbler on the streets of Abidjan. These are people very, very far away from the political establishment of Sierra Leone, which is precisely why they rebelled, right? It was a marginalized youth rebellion. And uh, unfortunately, they had a hard time organizing themselves in a coherent hierarchy. How you rose in rank in the RUF was usually, if you were the most sociopathic, that gave you rewards in the organization. So by being most reckless, um, being very aggressive and violent, that meant, you, that meant you rose in the ranks very fast. So even though there was an organization and a hierarchy, it was very decentralized. Even though they did have internal rules and codes of conduct, guys like Sam Bokery, also known as Mosquito, could break those rules with impunity. And that set the scene for all sorts, all sorts of um, paying yourself type of behavior within the organization, which contributed to its unraveling, particularly its violence against civilians. So that led to its disintegration. The Force Nouvelle, on the other hand, was a mutiny <coughs> of army officers from the north. All right, so they already had this endowment, this established organization with an established hierarchy, and which is, was a lot more easily able to slot back into the prevailing political establishment. So they were incorporated several years ago as a result of their historical institutional proximity to state authority. So that's what I think is going on. And that's the argument that I make in my, my book project. Okay, so a couple of concluding questions, the, the typical trifecta of discussion questions. Okay, so um, what are the scholarly implications of this? And what are the policy implications of this? Particularly from people that are interested in peacemaking operations. So if you are trying to graft a political settlement onto a government that's, you're gonna make them do business with a group of outsiders, well, you see how that goes in the RUF case. And um, I have all sorts of questions for what are some of the extensions and implications for future research, which include what implications does this have for the persistence of civil wars, for the persistence of rebel groups. So the emblematic is the Lord's Resistance Army, right, which I don't have in this, <coughs> have in this book. I did originally, but I've excluded it because we don't know what's gonna happen to them yet. But it's an interesting experiment to see what we can do to try to explain why the LRA have survived as long as they have. And do any of the things that I talk about in, in this book project matter to that. Thank you very much. Great, well I have many questions, but I'm gonna save them and yes. Me. Um, and ask folks, we have about 40 minutes or so left to come on up to the mic and share reactions, thoughts, questions, comments, um, etc. And I will um, save mine for afterwards. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. And please introduce yourself. So, Chris, um, sorry, I'm Michael. I'm one of Polly's mm -hmm. students. Great. Um, how do you assess uh, the future of the Islamic State uh, on your insider-outsider um, perspective? And how would you perceive their future in terms of their ability to govern within Syria and Iraq? Oh, boy. Okay, so the, the question... I'm sorry, should I have saved the tough question for later? No, it's fine. No, I, it's, it's a great question. And you got, you got the question? The truth is that I don't know the case very well. So the first question I would ask is, what is the organizational anatomy of the Islamic, Islamic State? Are, are these former regime insiders? Yes? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so they have, some, they have these uh, organizational endowments, which probably explains a lot in terms of how they've been able to gain momentum so quickly and, and take territory and how, and, you know, well, you've read Stanilan's book, uh, or at least the article yeah. for, for this week.
which might explain um, how they've been able to use resources so effectively. Um, well, I mean, if you follow my argument... Gen I, I would just jump in and say, I think generally, and Adam Bashko is here who's written a piece that we've also read on Syria. I don't think I, I would characterize the Islamic State as insiders. I don't yeah, no. know. The outsiders, I mean, no. they're, they're okay. overwhelmingly outsiders, I would say. Well, there's two things going on then, okay? Even if they were outsiders, the regime that they're fighting, let's pretend that they're fighting the Iraqi regime for a second, their strategies are um, being shaped a lot by outsiders as well, like the United States and, and, and their allies. So this is some, some of the mistakes that we make sometimes when we approach counterinsurgency, which is the flip side of peacemaking, that we don't take into account whether or not they're insiders or outsiders. So um, if they are indeed outsiders, um, true to prediction, if I'm right, um, they could win. You know, they could overthrow the Iraqi regime if they didn't have help from the United States. Okay, so this might be outside my scope conditions of, of my study because I'm looking at some, uh, symmetrical irregular warfare between rebel groups and governments that pretty much both suck, right? We're talking about, they have AK-47s and RPGs. They might be lucky if they have a tank and someone knows how to drive it. You know, you go to these battlefields and there's usually tanks that someone's driven into a ditch and they just sort of left because they can't figure out how to get it out. So it might be a little outside the scope conditions, but if you extend it, they can either win, okay, or depending on um, uh, how they organize themselves as a coalition of, ins of maybe some former insiders, but mainly dominated by outsiders, I would say that they'd probably figure out a way to disintegrate on their own. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Paige? I've got a question for each of you. So um, for Chris, I'm thinking about an alternative connection between the insider-outsider distinction and the outcomes you're trying to explain. So I'm not sure if this is a possible alternative causal mechanism sure. between them, or this is a possible spurious connection between them. Right. Um, and that is that I wonder if insiders are, uh, on average, more likely to, to want different things than outsiders, right? So if insiders want to be incorporated into the system with a better deal than they had before, right? They were players in the right. system, they want to be players in the system, and they just want more power and goodies, whatever. Whereas outsiders might be more likely to either want to completely transform society in some way, um, or as in the case of the RUF, just loot, right? And so those are things that are harder for a government to accommodate and incorporate, particularly with the attempt to transform society. Right. The question for, um, for Zach is a question about whether the difference in what rebels provide in the way of governance is driven um, by one of two things or both of these things. One is what they want to provide in terms of governance, that they see themselves as an alternative state and so they do state-like things, um, and, and versus uh, an argument that they are providing governance because they need to provide that governance governance because they need civilian support. So one is sort of driven by internal internal to their own preferences, and another one is a more um, uh, you know a means towards an end. And you could say a little bit. And it seems like there might be a connection between the two, at least on the two by two of aims versus history of state penetration. One of those might be more need driven and mm -hmm. more um, what they want to provide. But Shall I go first? Mm -hmm. um, great question, and it's something I've given some thought uh, to. So the, what I'd say is that it's very hard to draw a straight line between what a rebel group's motivations are and what they actually experience in warfare. So they all want to win, you know, they all want to be victorious, but they all, all in Africa, only about 10% of rebel groups have ever won out of about 150 since independence. So that's a very small percentage. So. I'd say, I mean, I think the intuition is, is interesting that former insiders might have a different set of goals than outsiders, but I'm not exactly sure that that's always the case. Um, motivations vary within organizations and between organizations, but they also change over time, right? So this is something I, I tried to say at the beginning, that there's this so fluidity of war aims over time that maybe your original goal was to overthrow the state, but maybe... Um, You'd also take a deal. Maybe becoming minister of sport is also fine for you. You know, at the end of it. So, 
um, I do address that actually um, very briefly that just by saying that um, motivations vary and they change over time so it's very difficult to say a rebel group won because they wanted to because most of them don't. No, right. I'm saying that what they would accept as winning is... Like well, I think, for in, in the, at least in the African context, for outsiders, I think there's an assumption that um, rebellion is also a way to try to negotiate yourself into the prevailing political establishment. At least in the, in the beginning, the RUF were trying to do that. Mm -hmm. But they became intoxicated with loot, and also they became beholden to the priorities of their sponsor, who was Charles Taylor, and they became dismembered by him as well. So I, I'm not sure that there would be a big difference <coughs> uh, between them, but it would be an interesting thing to, to look into more, more closely. Uh, I think it's a good question. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right. Uh, sorry. What I would say is that, you know, uh, for me, I, I don't want to, by, by shifting the focus away from, I'm getting echo, yeah? Uh, by shifting the focus away from, say, the military objective or the military strategies of armed groups and treating them instead as, uh, or paying attention to instead their, their non-violent activities, their, their attempts to provide services, I don't want to erase the question of, of military objectives. Of course, I think that's always going to be the primary concern for armed groups as they come into, uh, into control of territory. And, uh, but I think when we sort of shift our focus away from, from military objectives to try to understand all the other things that armed groups do, uh, that, you know, at least in my experience, that, you know, it's, it's rarely the case where uh, the leaders of armed groups enter into uh, a conflict situation with a clearly coherent plan for what they're going to do around non-military concerns, right? Uh, and in fact, like, that's one of the main critiques in the book is to sort of challenge kind of the, the assumption that ideology will determine how groups behave, right? So if you look again at the cases that I'm interested in, uh, you know, of the three, perhaps the most ideologically sophisticated leaders of these groups was a man named Ernest Wamba Diawamba, uh, who was a professor of mine at the University of Dar es Salaam. And he was a Marxist intellectual whose entire work has been studying guerrilla theory and, and how do you mobilize popular support in the context of a popular resistance movement, right? Um, but of course, we know what happens to that group once they actually take control of territory, and that is that because the military wing of the, of, the, of the movement was so much more dominant, questions of civilian governance were, were completely pushed aside. Right? And, and actually what's very interesting, for those of you who care, uh, you know, Wamba Wamba actually released a number of <laughs> treatises, I guess you would call them, where he outlines uh, uh, his plans for how he's going to create village level resistance by mobilizing the population behind the RCD. And of course, if you actually look at the trajectory of the RCD once it, once it becomes an armed group, uh, it, it completely violates any of those principles mm. completely, right? And it's, a, it's the movement that was least successful in, 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 in sort of generating any so, sort of popular <coughs> support. My general reading of it is that it, it's instead a, a product of, of, of the, the political environment that these leaders are navigating. So the contrary case would be someone like Prabhakar in, in the Tamil Tiger situation, right? There you actually have somebody who was never educated past the seventh or eighth grade. Uh, he, he was not versed or steeped in guerrilla theory in any meaningful sense. He was a, a rural villager. Uh, and then he comes into control of these territories and he's confronted by a population that had been accustomed to fairly high levels of social, ser social service provision by the Sri Lankan state since the 1970s, right? And so as a group, he is forced into a set of negotiations uh, with the local communities where they sort of say, look, we are willing to support you, but here's what we are going to need, right? And essentially what he's able to do or what the Tigers were able to do is to tap in to the local expertise that already existed amongst the civilian population and use civilians to try to build the governance infrastructure in tiger controlled territories in the first place. So what eventually emerges over time as a very elaborate governance system that covers a whole range of governance activities from public goods to symbolic activities to associations for women, associations for youth, all under the rubric of the tiger state, uh, was largely the project, pr the product of this negotiation process that the Tigers are, are constantly engaged in in the early phases of the war, right? And they're able to tap into that local expertise to develop, develop this governance capacity over time. Uh, so I think, to answer your question, is that it's much more of a, uh, of a means to an end, is, is that they're in this process of negotiation, and in order to prevent the kind of violent reprisals that characterize, say, the RCD in, in, in Congo, because what happens in Congo 
is that you have a series of nativist militias that rise up and say, look, you are treating us so badly, we are going to challenge you. And now all of a sudden the RCD is fighting a multi-front war, not only against the central government, but also against these nativist militias that fundamentally undermine the capacity to achieve its military objective. In contrast, by establishing more sort of open relations with the civilian population, the Tigers don't really have to deal with, with, with challenges emanating from the civilian population itself and are instead able to focus their efforts on their, their, their military objective. Roy and then Adam. Before I look at um, I just focus on this stuff is really good and your movement really in this direction. Let me ask you to sort of take this and see how it plays against a couple of ideas that have been floating around for a while. One is the notion that the government's experience changes the organization. And the, you know, Zahar has this notion that you bring a violent organization that takes over civilians, has responsibilities for that, you develop kind of separate power to deal with that, mm -hmm. more conflict within the organization, there's more pressure to be more moderate in some sense, or what they what that means. The other is, is this interesting argument that they're floating around that in civil war, it really matters who wins. And that rebel victories are, are more likely to result in a governing system which is more open and less likely, and as a result, less likely to result in civil war than, than victories by governments. And you guys are that literature. But sort of these, do you, do your experiences sort of play to this? What, is it, what do they say to these two? Ideas. Well, I'll take the second one first, because um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, what I would say to that is that, okay, so unless there's a pure victory, right, which is very rare, at least in the African context, where you have sometimes a pretty substantial transformation of the political order. So, for example, in Uganda in 1986, um, when the NRA marched to town, they pretty much transformed the, the fabric of, of, of Ugandan political society or in the RPF case in Rwanda, for example. So those are the rare cases. Most of the time, the political order, what, what this story I'm telling uh, kind of points to is that the political order is actually really hard to change through rebellion. So if you're satisfied by being incorporated within the establishing prevailing order, nothing much changes. Right? And so that's, that's the norm is that the whole system that creates a system of insiders and outsiders remains intact. So it's very difficult to, to change the order. Does that make sense? I'm not sure what to say about the first uh, question. That might be a better question for you, Zach. Sure. Um, I think you're absolutely correct that governance does transform organizations. I mean, at a very base level, you know, as you point out, there are a variety of material and personnel costs involved with establishing a governance system. And this is why you have groups like the RPF that might just decide it's not worth the effort and who seek to expel the civilian population because then you don't have to deal with this issue of establishing a, a very potentially costly civil administration system. Um, so I think you're absolutely correct that I think, you know, when we, when we talk about governance, that it has this, this potential, not necessarily to, to, to moderate uh, uh, the, the behavior of an armed group, but that it, it forces an armed group to think of itself as something beyond a military organization. And that this transformation also has the potential to bring into the organization a whole variety of different types of actors. So one of the things that the Tigers, was, tigers were able to do in, in the Sri Lankan case, as well as the SPLA in, in, in southern Sudan, was to bring into their organization a variety of non-military specialists, people who had much more of a technical background, uh, people who were perhaps based abroad in the diaspora who would return to Sri Lanka and, and operate within the educational system, within the healthcare system, within the relief and development mechanisms that they had established, and who were never or never had any intention of becoming fighters. Right? Uh, and that, of course, is going to have some sort of transformative impact on the overall organizational structure itself. Uh, within limits, right? Because even in the Tigers case, where they had this very elaborate structure, it remained till its end uh, a, a deeply personalized system rotating around the figure of Prabhakaran. And even towards the end of the war, when he was receiving a lot of advice from people who were outside of the, the context, Civil War context, many of the people who were involved in these non military aspects of the organization, it, he was the one who made the decision to continue fighting, which led to the ultimate outcome. Um, just a quick point on, uh, on this. This is actually why I think recognition is, is, is potentially a useful tool that the international community should use. Right? If, we, if we know that, that, that taking governance seriously has the potential to transform an organization, then why not wield that as, as a mechanism or as, as, as some sort of incentive whereby we try to encourage groups to take more seriously the task of civil administration with the hope that we can 
bring them more into the uh, sort of legitimate negotiation process, right? I know this is somewhat idealistic, but I think if we, if we, if we contrast that against our approach right now, which tends to be to eschew these kind of organizations and pretend like they are, you know, don't negotiate with terrorists, uh, what are we doing besides damning the civilian population to horrific, uh, you know, horrific experiences and, and realities? Right. I, I might add to that, actually, just getting back to the SPLA case. So in South Sudan, the SPLA, they certainly had governance structures, but so many services were provided by international organizations um, from the late, late 80s, basically. So you had this thing called Operation Lifeline Sudan, which was the UN umbrella organization for dozens of NGOs doing all sorts of different things in South Sudan, food distributions, but also education, healthcare, et cetera. And so built into this intervention was an explicit attempt to try to hold the SPLA and its the other faction, the SSIA, um, accountable. And so coming off your, your question about, you know, does governing change these organizations, I think that was the idea of Operation Lifeline Sudan, was to let's, let's, make, them, let's make them into a partner in the delivery of these systems. And so they all had a humanitarian wing, which was not really distinguishable from the SPLA, but um, it, it was still there on paper. But what was interesting that happened over time is that the language of the ground rules gave a lot of uh, autonomy and authority to the humanitarian wing of the SPLA. In order, you know, they could assert certain rules over NGOs, like who they could hire, who they could fire, what kind of levies that they would have to pay to use airstrips, et cetera. And have you ever heard of the STAR program? This was something that was in the State Department in the 1990s that was explicitly trying to develop the SPLA's governing capacity. Because there's an idea that eventually this war is going to end and the SPLA is going to have to take up actual governance functions as state leaders. So let's use these rudimentary structures through the humanitarian system, which is the main link that they have with outside actors, to try to cultivate uh, basic civic organization and, and governance structures. And so that was, they put a ton of money into it. And so out of that, in the, I guess the early 2000s, there's a whole new thing that the SPLA sprung on the international community, which was the agreement on ground rules. Have you heard about that? No, the, the MOU, oh, the MOU, the MOU which was the agreement on ground rules kind of on steroids. They really took over the, the humanitarian operation <coughs> and they asserted authority over all these NGOs. And of course the NGOs got all indignant and stormed out of the country, but then came back. Um, but it was this big crisis because suddenly humanitarian organizations that pride themselves on being neutral and independent and impartial had to subordinate themselves to this authority, um, which was sort of an outcome of this probably decade, decade and a long half experience with taking on this governance roles at the behest of outside actors in the first place. So it's kind of an interesting story. Come off your question. Adam? Yeah, uh, I, have, I have some questions for, for each of you. Zach, I have, I have to... Um, one thing you, you're saying, uh, ethno uh, uh, or separatist uh, insurgency would be more likely to build an institution than the one that would be reformist aiming at the center. And you know, I would intuitively argue the reverse, thinking I've seen quite a few movements: you know, the Taliban, the Free Syrian Army, the FMLN, the FARC, the FMLN in Salvador, the FARC in Colombia. And I think, on the country, having to face the state essentially creates a competition in which you know, providing institution would be, would be more important. So could you elaborate on, on, on distinction? Uh, uh, and the second is what happens if, if instead of insurgency, it's a, it's a group uh, oriented towards profit. And I mean by that, like the Mexican cartel in Michoacan, uh, the Knights Templar uh, 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 cartel, which is actually providing social services. Does it change something or actually the provision of social services? is more important than the aim of the organization, which is making profit. And, and Chris, I was wondering what's the link between, because basically the insider outsider distinction leads, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a question on the social network of the actors, mm -hmm. their relation towards the social network being power, that inside or outside the social network, mm -hmm. if I'm correct. Well, more political network, but yeah. Um, how, do it, how does it relate to organizational knowledge? Because you could build organizational knowledge outside the state. I'm thinking like, you know, it could be training camps, but it also can be 
um, you know, for example, in Somalia, uh, uh, clerics have a real organizational knowledge that is outside the state. Right. And it, if, if, if this relation between networks and organizational knowledge is a complex one, what role do external actors play in it, especially the supporting yeah. services? Right. I can go first. Uh, so the question of why secessionists might be more inclined to establish governance structures, you know, I, I have a lot of answers for that question, but I think I'll, I want to emphasize that I don't think it's a determinative factor, right? What I was interested in is just trying to understand, like, what are the initial preferences that armed groups enter into a conflict space with? And I think, you know, to me, again, I think secessionists would have a, a, a core logic of establishing a parallel authority because what is a secessionist movement beyond this, this claim that we can establish a governing structure that would be better than the governing structure that we have currently, right? It's not simply a claim of we want to take over the governing structure, but that we want to completely do away and, and establish a new order, which I think is, is important for why, uh, why some groups take governance more seriously. But I, but I certainly wouldn't uh, argue against the possibility that a center-seeking group can take seriously the task of governance. I'll tell you just a, a brief sort of example uh, of, of why I, I, I think that there is some support for this, this, this premise. You know, if you look at what happened in India in the 1970s with the Naxalites, right? Uh, you know, early on in the in the movement, there were a lot of NGOs that were working with the same sort of populations uh, in areas that the Naxalites controlled, and the Naxalites actually kicked out the NGOs, right, and said, "We don't want you working here." And the question was, "Well, why did you do this?" It seems like, you know, like the SPLA case, you can use the NGOs to to sort of take care of some of these civilian needs, that you, so you don't have to devote resources to them. And their basic response was, well, we don't want the NGOs to improve the conditions of the people too much, right? Because then will, people will stop supporting us. <laughs> so to, to me, there is something about, you know, a, a center-seeking group that, that needs to be able to make that claim, that somehow the state is continuing to fail and that the only solution then becomes state <coughs> capture. Right? It's not sufficient to say, well, we can establish our own institutions and that they will outperform the state. Hence, my, my, my thinking that the secessionist movements are, are likely to be better. Um, as far as what, you know, how far this logic extends to, to other types of non-state groups, I mean, I think that, you know, we are living in, a, in an era in which there's a tremendous amount of interest in this question of non-state governance, and I think there are very interesting uh, research programs that have emerged that are looking at a variety of non-state groups, not only armed actors, but also things like multinational corporations, also things like international agencies, all of which are starting to enter into these spaces where the state, for whatever reason, is no longer capable or no longer willing to provide governance in some way. Right? And so we have this blossoming of literature around non-state governance, and I think the literature on rebel governance is, 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 is certainly a part of that broader research program. Right, uh, and I've and I've you know participated in quite a few projects that have tried to make these connections. Now, you know, the issue of specifically their relationship to other armed groups, like cartels, uh, you know, to me there is an important political dimension that we have to retain, right? And that's why early on I said, you know, my interest is not only in groups that are operating outside of state control, but also operating against state control, right? And that's an important part of the dynamic. That, that I think shapes the actual governance outcomes that we see. Uh, if you're something like a cartel, your basic agenda is, is to kind of avoid the state altogether, right? To challenge the state when it tries to encroach on your turf, but you don't necessarily benefit from overturning the state itself, right? Theoretically. Um, whereas if you are a rebel group, the presumption is that you're either trying to overturn the state or carve out a territory completely from the state itself. But the state will always retain a number of advantages under international law that make it the premier competitor to your political project. Right? And as such, you know, in, in, the, in what I was discussing here, I didn't actually talk too much about what the state can do to limit the, the capacity of an armed group to establish a governance system. But in fact, the state is always the premier oppositional element to any rebel-induced program of political and social order, right? And the state retains a whole series of advantages, uh, both domestically derived as well as derived from their privileged position within international society that allow it to constantly uh, challenge the capacity of armed groups to, to, to establish any sort of social and political order within the areas that they operate within. Uh, so to answer your question briefly, I think that there are all sorts of parallels to other types of non-state groups, both violent and non-violent, but that it's important to retain the specificity of, what, what, of, of who these actors are within international and domestic societies in order to understand the actual political projects that they're engaged in, right? not simply the economic concerns that may drive their behavior. All right, you've got two questions. Um, the first one is, um, 
you know, what kind of other sources of cohesion can you see for rebellion? So it, certainly being a group of former state actors is not the only source of organizational cohesion that a rebel group can have. There's, you know, sort of, there could be some sort of a, a local norms or a sort of ethnic dimension to it. So uh, no one's saying that those can't be uh, a basis for organization uh, for any rebel group, but what's salient here is really the type that I'm talking about <coughs> here is the one that's more likely to have a rebel group um, slot back into the state. So if a regime is facing down a very cohesive rebellion that could be um, a sort of ethnic-based group, um, it doesn't matter how cohesive they are as an organization, it's whether or not they have that kind of institutional linkage to the, to the prevailing political establishment. And there's certain differences between sort of the more local, sort of let's just say ethnic-based uh, organizational norms and <coughs> organizational norms that come from institutions, right? They do things to, they sort of, there's routinized practices, there's, has impact on time horizons. Uh, there's, there's qualitative differences between that type of uh, basis for organization and something you might see outside institutions, state institutions. So um, that's one. Um, but uh, I, I, I certainly wouldn't discount uh, alternative forms of, of organization. The one that's salient to the fates of rebels, though, are the ones that determine whether or not you can join the club again, and that uh, that's what that's what matters. So, the second question is the role of outside resources, and I'm glad you asked that. Now, I had in the dissertation, I had a big moving part of the dissertation, which is the role of foreign resources. But Zach made me get rid of it for the for the book project. Um, but the good news is that um, I've sort of broken it off as as another standalone project. So I'm I'm looking at basically proxy warfare and the role of outside actors on, on what happens to rebel groups, um, mainly in Africa, but you could take it to you know, the Taliban's linkages to Pakistan, et cetera. Um, and what I think is going on here is that, um, so Stanline, getting back to Stanline, you read Stanline this week, he argues that it doesn't matter where the resources come from or what kind of resources there are. What matters is the organizational capacity to be able to use those resources, and that depends on different types of networks, right, vertical or horizontal networks. What I would argue is that um, we should probably start paying attention to the politics behind those resources and the imperatives of the regimes that support rebel groups in neighboring states. So all the conflicts that I talk about are all conflict systems, right? You have Charles Taylor supporting the RUF or a couple of rebel groups in Ivory Coast. Uganda supported the SPLA. Sudan supported the LRA, plus a bunch of other rebel groups in Uganda. So right now, the Seleka Rebellion in CAR has linkages to Sudan and Chad. So there's definitely these tendrils of organization that extend outside the rebel organization, and they get, they get a lot of stuff from outside, particularly territory, which seems to matter the most. Right? They can have sanctuary, they can incubate and, uh, and train. Right. So what I'm interested in looking at is whether or not the imperatives of, of the sponsor can actually dictate the trajectory of the rebel group. So we kind of assume that there's a certain amount of autonomy that rebel groups have when making their own decisions and, and designing their strategies. But if you take the case of the RUF, for example, from the very beginning, they were beholden to Charles Taylor's strategic imperatives. In fact, they weren't even called the RUF at the beginning. They were a little tiny little battalion within the MPFL in Liberia. And Charles Taylor, when they inv invaded Sierra Leone at the beginning, the Sierra Leonean contingent was just a small section of what was basically a Liberian invasion of Sierra Leone. And they were all subject to the hierarchy of the Liberian commanders. And so that stripped them of a lot of their original autonomy um, from being able to make decisions. And so the Liberians were actually very predatory towards civilians. And the RUF, the Sierra Leoneans had a big falling out with the Liberians at the beginning because of that. Um, they were getting tired of being ordered around. And, they'd, and so they'd be able to tell you uh, if you were Sierra Leonean or not. There was, they said, Genke know you? Genke, Charles Genke tell you. They would sig that would be a signal to see whether or not you were Liberian or Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. Sierra Leonean, Genke know you? No? Okay, well then get in the back of the truck. And uh, um, they had a falling out for a while, but then they rejoined in the late 90s and early 2000s and became another instrument of Taylor for his regional strategic interests. What's interesting is that you'd expect to see sponsorship a function of whether or not 
a sponsor wants a rebel group to succeed. You know, okay, I'm going to give you a bunch of weapons and ammunition. <clears throat> Turns out ammunition is actually very important. Um, because I want you to overthrow the government and then we can have friendly relations. What I think is going on is you expect to see national security and stable boundaries uh, a function of a logical national security policy, right? We want Canada to be stable because we don't want our border state destabilized with Canada. But in the African context, what's interesting is it's not a question of national security per se, but regime security. And regime security can often mean destabilizing boundary regions because th it's those boundary regions that create threats to your regime from within your own territory. So sometimes the goal is just to destabilize, not to change the political order in a neighboring country because that enhances your own security prerogatives, whether it be uh, uh, regional hegemony or economic agendas like in the T Charles Taylor case. So which is the question, like, so what determines these different, so in the ADFL case in Congo, you had two sponsors, Rwanda and Uganda, that saw their proxy through to the bitter end of overthrowing Mobutu and installing himself as president of Congo. Um, in the Liberia Sierra Leone case, you had a case where Charles Taylor was fine just dismembering the RUF and using them as his puppets. And then you had cases like the LRA in, in Uganda, um, for a long time, and even now, people are arguing that Sudan is still kind of keeping the LRA in its back pocket just in case it needs it for a rainy day. In fact, we know that Joseph Kony is in Sudan. He's in a place called Kafia Kind, which is right on the border of South Sudan and Sudan. So that's a question I'm, I'm really interested in answering, is what um, determines these different uh, types of sponsorship. Now, if you follow my theory in my book, what you might expect to see is that the groups that are more cohesive um, and this is in line with Staniland, you'd expect to see them have more autonomy vis-a-vis -vis their sponsor and maybe push back a little bit, um, be especially because they always have an exit. Um, they can always join their own government that they're fighting. The groups that don't have a lot of uh, uh, insiders, they might be more susceptible to dismemberment by their sponsor if the sponsor feels like doing it. So that's a really interesting project that, uh, you wanna co-author? <laughs> yeah, so we're going to just collect a last couple of questions and then we're going to have to wrap it up. So, yes. Yeah, um, I'm Devin Curtis, I'm at the University of Cambridge. Um, I just wanted to follow up on actually a question that was posed previously uh, about sort of alternative explanations. And the one I wanted to ask about is this idea that to explain variation in rebel movement, um, one needs to look at the state itself. That's kind of a Will Lino argument that actually rebel movements tend to reflect the state that they come from. And so if you have a very fragmented state, you would have a very fragmented rebel movement. Um, centralized states tend to produce a centralized movement. And that would explain, I mean, to Chris's point, that would explain a movement such as the RPF and the strategies that it has used to govern after taking power as well. So the nature of the state itself is important. And I'm wondering how that fits into the, your theory, and I guess for, for Zach as well, because your idea of state penetration kind of um, deals with that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering then if you think that that's actually just not enough, and that you're more optimistic about the possibilities for international actors and others to kind of change the quarter, to change the behavior of, of these groups, and that they're not simply a reflection or a mirror of the sort of social and political order that has produced them. Yes. Uh, I'm Jason Stern, I'm currently at NYU, um, and my question sort of bears nicely Devon's, except it's the opposite. To what degree is the social embeddedness of armed groups into local society? So not the reflection of the state, but the degree to which they are embedded within local society. To what degree does that predispose them to better or worse governance, you could say, or more effective governance? Zach's more coming to, to you, I guess. Um, and, I mean, so you could say, Zach, that the LTT was great at it because it was <coughs> dealing with the mono-ethnic uh, rebellion, the mono-ethnic group of people that they're ruling over. South Sudan, less, I mean, more duo, but there's more plurality, but still, broadly speaking, the, the rulers sort of matched on to, or the rebels matched on to the population they're engaging with, and the RCD, not at all, really. In fact, the RCD was perceived as hostile for most of the population. Or because they were not embedded, they really did not come from that. So it's sort of a follow-on to, to that. Thing. 
Yeah, go ahead, Huma. Hi, I'm Huma. I'm a college student. And uh, my question might be too simplified, but to what degree, I guess this is more for Chris, do you blame um, the fate of, fate of rebels in, in the case of Sierra Leone, the RUF, uh, on or the role they played in the recovery of Sierra Leone's, you know, state failure or collapsed state. So in the sense that considering they didn't really get a punishment, um, how much did that contribute to the recovery process after the conflict? Okay, okay. Any other? Yes. Um, it seemed like we talked a lot about uh, the central leadership of the rebel group when we talked about uh, rebel governance and then things about the civilian population that seem to reflect more community level things. I wonder uh, if there is if, if there's an important part of the story with how much agency loss or how much decentralization there is in the rebel group. How much control do uh, local rebel units or uh, the people actually interacting with the civilians on a day to day basis have in uh, governance outcomes? Okay, and I'm just going to pose a couple of questions myself, and then we'll give you guys five minutes. Maybe you pick in. I'm sorry. We have another event coming in in 15 minutes. But um, to touch on whichever of the questions are most kind of germane to you. Um, my first question is, uh, I'm wondering if, if each of you could speculate a little bit about the calculus of the state as a function of the different arguments that you've presented. So I'm wondering, Zach, if you, if from what you've seen, capable rebel governors represent a threat from the perspective of the state, either in the midst of the insurgency or after the fact, thinking about whether or not to include them, or represent a kind of valuable opportunity to outsource governing to hard to control territory or post-conflict to have actually, it's valuable to have actors with capable subnational governing. So I wonder if you can talk a bit about that. And Chris, for you, it, I could imagine for the reasons you described why insiders would be valuable partners to have post-conflict. I could also imagine how insiders who've turned on you are sort of the ultimate traitors can't be trusted going forward. Yeah. So I wonder if you can talk about that a bit. And and maybe to, to whoever's interested in picking this up, we, we haven't talked explicitly about legitimacy um, yet in the context of, of rebel governance and political futures of rebel groups. And from, and I think, Zach, you framed it this way in your book, this t tension between coercion and consensus building. And I wonder if in the context of many current rebel threats that we see today, how do you go about deciphering whether or not a group has established legitimacy in its territory when people are living under either the people that have the most um, autonomy have fled, or, um, and, and this is, I guess, a methodological question too, or the people are, you know, are living under the threat of violence and so maybe are not in, really in an honest position to make an assessment about bestowing their authority to a particular group or party. So with that, five minutes to each of you. Okay. Want me to go? Sure, I'll go ahead. Oh. That's, that's fine with me, okay. Um, so first of all, to answer the first question about the RPF, first of all, Will, Will Reno, I love Will, he's my dissertation advisor actually, so we're pretty <laughs> close. And just to answer your question, the RPF were actually outsiders. You know, they were incubated in Uganda, and they were very, they were very far away from the uh, political establishment in Rwanda. So I don't think they were a reflection at all of Rwanda at all. Um, maybe a reflection more of Uganda, if that argument holds. But getting back to the Uganda case, this is um, w one of the cases that I use in the in the book project. Is that there's actually a lot of variation within Uganda itself. So if you look at the precursor to the LRA, which is called the Uganda People's Democratic Army. There was two rebel groups in the West Nile. There was one group in the Southwest called the ADF, plus a collect, there's about 50 groups um, since 1986. And they all had different shapes and sizes and different um, dimensions of insider or outsider. 
So because of that within country variation, I think that um, means that you, they're not a direct reflection of, of, of the politics of the country. But if you want to make that argument, then maybe all African states have that kind of fragmented nature, right? Not all, but most. Um, the second question about social embeddedness um, and uh, whether or not that matters to, uh, to rebel face, to rebel fates, is that like, like I think I've mentioned this before, is that there can be alternative sources of cohesion for rebel groups and social embeddedness might be one of them. But that's only salient to their fates when, if that group in which they're embedded is um, connected to the political establishment in the broader scene of political society. So you can have a marginal ethnic group, for example, and have a large degree of social embeddedness in that group. But if that group isn't considered on the status hierarchy of state politics very important, then that, that's still going to have the same impact on, on their trajectory in civil war. Um, and, oh, and then the Sierra Leone question. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, I went back to Sierra Leone long after the war ended in 2009, thinking about those types of questions. You know, what does this country look like now? And it's certainly still one of the poorest countries in the world. Corruption is still there, even worse maybe. But, um, you, know, you know, there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There was a special court that tried not just RUF members, but members of the regime um, and, and militias for war crimes. Um, I really don't know. I think that's a really good research question, actually. You know, what you, need, you need to go answer that. Um, to what extent did um, many of the RUF fighters given amnesty and getting off the hook matter to what happened after the war? Um, I'm not really sure. Um, I think not, not, not much, to be honest with you. There's bigger things going on um, in Sierra Leone than... In fact, the way that they managed the end of the war might have been a good outcome for Sierra Leone because there's that sense of they didn't have to choose peace over justice. You know, they, some RUF members got thrown under the bus of international justice, which sent a message, I think. And, they, and they've had two, maybe even three elections now since the end of the war, which is a good sign. Okay, uh, let, me, let me go in some somewhat of a weird order here. Uh, let me answer the question on organizational structures of the armed group. You know, I think, you know, I'm, I'm very much in the camp that believes that, that local dynamics are very important in terms of determining how effective uh, governance structures are in a particular area. Uh, you know, I, I, so the question is, you know, do, are decentralized movements better? Are, are movements that, that sort of devolve a considerable amount of authority to a local level commander better at providing governance? And the answer to that, I think, is, you know, it, it, it highly depends, right? In, in some cases, like South Sudan, there was a high degree of autonomy given to each of the commanders, and so governance often reflected this variation in individual commander initiative, right? In some areas where the commanders were engaged with civilian governance questions, you actually had a, a fairly functional political order that was established. In other areas where commanders were more interested in, in personal uh, gain, you, you tended to see governance that reflected that. So it's very hard to make a generic statement about which is better um, because there is such huge variation involved when you start to decentralize uh, control of governance functions down to lower levels. I will say that you know, at, the, at the broad level, you know, uh, governance also is, is, is a very difficult and, and expensive process, and so there is some value to retaining a hierarchical organizational structure. If you have a command that is able to kind of issue commands that, 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 that penetrate down to the lowest level uh, and have even, say, the individual cadre on the ground obeying uh, restrictions put in place by, say, uh, an armed group's code of, of rules, right? Uh, then you're probably likely to have a broader effect and a more uniform effect over governance provision within a particular territory. Um, so, you know, you can see it both ways, right? The point is that you often do end up with, with considerable variation at the local level once you actually start digging into this. And in my book, I tried to look at two areas of control in each of the cases so I could see uh, what accounts for this internal variation within these different projects. Um, in terms of the, the calculus of the state, the Dipali's question, uh, you know, I, I think absolutely that, 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 that states uh, can view armed groups both as threats as well as resources. Uh, you certainly see this in almost all of the, the cases that I study. Uh, let me just give you one particular example that I think is very interesting, and that would be the Sri Lankan case. I mean, I already spoke a bit about how the Sri Lankan government and the Tamil Tigers came together to provide health and education systems in areas of tiger control. 
But actually, the more interesting example is perhaps what happened after the tsunami in that country, uh, where there was a very extensive internationally sanctioned process whereby they created a joint mechanism through which aid distribution was meant to go both to government as well as rebel aid channels, right? Uh, basically, the Sri Lankan state said, look, 30,000 Tamils were killed in northern and eastern Sri Lanka as a result of the tsunami. We don't have the resources to go and take care of those communities, so we're going to allow the rebel group to open up a line of negotiations directly with international relief organizations as well as international agencies so that relief can get to those areas more quickly in the short term. So in that case, you had a very clear example of where the state faced with such an extreme crisis, was forced to give greater authority to the, to the armed group, even if in the long run that makes no rational sense for them to do so. Um, okay, on the questions of uh, social and political order, about, yeah, social embeddedness and, and, and the relation with the state, the first one, you know, I think, so again, I don't think it's determinative, right? I think that it's a very important factor, and I, I do emphasize it considerably in my book. But I don't believe that, that armed groups are solely determined by the nature of the state itself. I mean, I think one thing that I always like to remember is that there's a huge uh, imaginative aspect to engaging in armed struggle. You have to believe that you can be victorious, that you can actually succeed in this tremendously risky project of constructing an alternate social and political order. And oftentimes we forget that very human element of, of, of picking up arms against the state. Right. And if you don't believe that you can actually transform the pre-existing social and political institutions that you're confronting, then why bother fighting a war in the first place? Right. So <coughs> I am of the sort of belief, and I think I can show you plenty of examples where this is the case, that you, know, you, you have to address the conditions that you face. And that's where the question of the state is extremely important. Right. But if you don't imagine a way to get beyond those conditions, then I'm not sure why you were rebelling in the first place, right? And there are many examples where, where armed groups really think through how to, to, to go past it, right? And to me, Amilcar Cabral is probably the great theorist of this, of trying to, you know, for example, in the case of, of, of Guinea, introduce participatory structures at the village level as, as a response to Portuguese colonialism, to show that, look, we're not bound by this logic of, of domination that has prevailed up to now, and we are going to do things in a different way. Um, on the question of social embeddedness, I mean, I, I agree with you completely, right? This is why I, I believe that secessionist or ethno-nationalist movements have uh, a greater capacity to establish these types of structures. There are inherent advantages to being an ethno-nationalist movement when it comes to questions of governance. But at the same point, I would also just suggest that you know, these things were not predetermined, right? I think that uh, the SPLA actually, I would perhaps disagree with your characterization of it in, in that you know, there was no unified Southern Sudanese identity until the wars began. Right. Uh, South Sudan is a place characterized by multiple ethnicities, multiple religious traditions, multiple linguistic traditions. There are very deep and, and enduring divisions within the southern population, as we see from the ongoing war, a war that actually has its roots in the war with Khartoum itself. The statistic that's often thrown out is that more people died in internal south, southern fighting during the war than, against, than with the war against Khartoum. Um, so it is a, it's, it's a project of social construction, right? And this is why I think governance is, is very important because governance becomes the mechanism through which uh, identities are constructed. And the SPLA, um, perhaps too late, I mean, they, they did it largely in response to this crisis that they faced when the new air faction broke away. They really took seriously this task of trying to develop this unified southern identity, right? And it was an active process. It wasn't something that they, had, they could simply presume, but instead they had to try to work to get all these diverse peoples to identify and to fight and die on behalf of an identity that previously had no actual, you know, uh, meaning in the Sudanese context until after the war broke out, right? Uh, the last thing on the question of legitimacy, um, you know, this is a very slippery concept within the social sciences. We struggle with it. Uh, what is legitimacy? How does it differ from, say, authority? Uh, how does it differ from, say, just the provision of, of, of effective public goods, which, are, which was the standard that I used in my study? Uh, and I'm thinking about it a lot, actually. I have a, a paper that, that you know, is going to be part of an edited volume on rebel governance which will hopefully one day come out. Uh, uh, and, and you know, this is why I think, and I didn't have much time to talk about it, but I think this is why the sort of symbolic and cultural space becomes so important, right? When we think about governance, of course it's you know, important to, to enumerate all of these specific, specific social service functions that a particular government provides, but you know, think about your own relationship to your government and you realize that it's not merely 
determined by the goods that are provided to you, but also this symbolic construction of membership. Right. Uh, this is why, you know, starting from you know, first grade in the United States, you are told to, to say the Pledge of Allegiance. You learn the national anthem. You understand what it means to be an American, right, uh, or whatever nation you happen to come from. And this is a process of social construction that I think is very integral to any understanding of legitimacy, right? Uh, legitimacy is, is distinct from authority. We can, we can define authority in very technical terms. Legitimacy, not so much, precisely because it involves this symbolic dimension. And that's precisely what I'm, I've been trying to work on more recently when it comes to questions of governance. Wonderful. Well, now the room has become pitch dark, which means <laughs> I think is a not so subtle sign that we have to wrap, wrap up. up. Please join me in thanking our speakers and thank you very much. For being here.